You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I know you've been seriously thinking about that. So how do you show your love for God? Now, I don't feel embarrassed about this. There's no right or wrong answer to it. This is not a test. You do not pass or fail, church. <laughs> How do you show your love for God? And if I don't get any responses, that will be terrific. Because that will really back up what I'm about to say in a few minutes. <laughs> See, you, you can sabotage the whole sermon by coming up with all sorts of great stuff. Kindness. By showing kindness? Okay. <clears throat> Let's pursue that just a little bit. Kindness to who or what? To everyone. To everyone. Okay. There you go. We got one. We're on a roll. <laughs> How do you show your love for God? By understanding people. By understanding people. Did anybody or? Just anybody. So I'm trying to okay. understand what they're going to do. Okay, so, okay. Identify with people's struggles. By serving people. <coughs> By serving people. Okay, we're on three. Let's see if we can get one more. Because there is a really great sermon to follow this. <laughs> <laughs> At least I think it's great. I wrote it. One more. By treating people the way you want to. By treating people the way you want to? We want to be treated. Why? The way you want to be treated. Okay, so loving your neighbor as you'd love yourself. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. If your story of church is the same as mine, or similar to mine, then it is almost a sure thing that like I did, you attended Sunday school as a child. And if that is so, then it is almost also a sure thing that as I did, somewhere along the way, you were taught to sing the children's hymn, God Sees the Little Sparrow Fall. I see some heads nodding here. So we're going to sing it. We won't ask Andrew to play it, but we're going to sing it. If you know it. Just one verse in chorus. God sees the little sparrow fall in each his tender view. If God so loves the little birds, I know he loves me too. He loves me too. I can tell that you really enjoy singing those children's hymns. That hymn and others like it undoubtedly served as our introduction to the notion that God loves us. Today's sermon is in two parts. The first section will explore how God loves us, or God's love for us. And the second, and possibly the more important part of the sermon, will be a consideration of our love for God and what it means, or ought to mean, to love God. The text is from Matthew 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts 
be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Book of Solomon, or the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, as it's sometimes called, is one of the least known books in the Bible. Now you may be shocked to think that this would be true of a minister, but when I went to look up the Song of Solomon in my Bible, I had to consult the index to see where it was. If you want to check it out, just remember that it follows the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you don't know where Ecclesiastes is, go to the index. <laughs> The Song of Solomon, of all the books in the Bible, is probably the most steamy. You can get harder than the collar reading Song of Solomon. It's a book that can make a Harlequin romance blush. <laughs> it's the story of one man's passionate love for a woman. The man is presumably David's son, Solomon. And the woman is his new bride. Be assured that this is not the kind of Bible story that you want to read to your children or your grandchildren. It is so off the wall that our upright Methodist and Presbyterian forebears declared that the Song of Solomon was not fit to be read in public worship. So how did a book like this get into our Bible? Quite simply, the Song of Solomon is an allegory. It is a story about God's extravagant love for the people of Israel and by extension for us. The book of Hosea is also a story about God's extravagant love for the people of Israel and again by extension for us. In the book of the prophet Hosea, people of Israel are compared to a rebellious child who has turned away from God. And like the frustrated parents of a rebellious child, God struggles with trying to figure out how to deal with this troubling situation. Prophet Isaiah says, look, God, you have two choices. First, you can disown that child, kick him out of the house, and have nothing more to do with him. Or, you can punish that child severely. God mulls these options over. And in the end, decides to do nothing aside from continuing to love this troublesome child. In the closing verses of the book of Hosea, God says, I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. There was a time when if you watched Major League Sports on TV, football, baseball, not so much hockey, but football and baseball, that you might have caught a glimpse of somebody in the stands holding up a poster that said, John 3, 16. Of all the passages in the Bible, I'm confident that that's one passage that most of you can recite from memory. But we're not going to test that theory out. 
I'm just going to remind you that John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but may have everlasting life. Those words remind us in very strong and clear terms that God loves us. And note that there are no conditions attached to that. There's no, God loves you as long as. It's just simply, God loves you for who and what you are. And that's a truly remarkable thing. In his book, The Heart of Christianity writes, The Christian life is not about believing or doing what we need to believe or do so that we can be saved. In other words, don't focus so much on the fact that, you know, being a Christian is all about earning enough brownie points to get you to heaven. That's not what it's about. He goes on to say, Rather, being a Christian is about seeing what is already true. That God loves us already. And then beginning to live in this relationship. That's what John 3, 16 is inviting us to do. To live in this loving relationship with God. Now, we know, beyond all doubt, that God loves us. And we also know, beyond all doubt, that we love God. What we don't know for sure is how we show our love for God. How we give expression to that love. When we want to show our love for God, we need to think in terms of paying attention to God. And how do we do that? How do we pay attention to God? Well, one way is to make time for God every day of our lives. I'm not talking length of time, just time. Some time for God every day. Some time to spend with God in prayer, perhaps in reading the Bible. Maybe meditation is your thing or some other spiritual discipline. Show your love for God by making time for God every day. We demonstrate our love for God by paying attention to God in gathering for worship, such as this, or at some other time during the week, wherever or whenever worship might take place. It's a way in which we pay attention to God. We pay attention to God when we read devotional books or other inspirational books that help us to come to terms to develop greater clarity concerning our beliefs, our faith, and our convictions. We pay attention to those we love most in this life. Why do we find it so difficult to show our love for God by paying attention to God? We show our love for God when we invite God to be the center of our lives. Now, it's time for you to think again. And I want you to think about what 
in life is most important to you? Just ponder for a minute. This is my life. And what is the most important thing in my life? And I won't ask for your responses this time. Is it your family? Is that what's most important to you? Is it me? Maybe I'm the most important. Is it my health? Is it my financial security? Is it my work? However you answer that question will enable you to identify what's at the center of your life. Your life revolves around the answer to that question. Very seldom will we say that God is in the center of our lives. For most of us, if we're honest, we'd have to say, God is somewhere on the edges of my life. Kind of like the planet Saturn. Way up there. Not really all that close to the center of of our solar system. We show our love for God when we invite God to come in towards the center and become the center of our existence. The Apostle Paul says that when you do that, when God becomes the center of your life, then you free yourselves to embrace the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit that he identifies as love, peace, joy, harmony, goodwill, friendship, and some others that are forgotten. You can look up the fruits of the Spirit and see what else you can find. We show our love for God when we love who and what God loves. And this is where Christian discipleship gets really tough. Loving what God loves is a hard nut for us to crack. Because we don't really love everything that God loves. So what does God love? God loves the world. John 3.16, back to that, tells us in no uncertain terms. For God so loved the world. We want to show our love for God that we are called to love the world. If we love the world, then we will be concerned with things like global warming, Arctic ice melt, environmental degradation, air and water pollution, endangered species. We will love the world in the way that God loves the world. We will love those who God loves. Well, that's easy enough. As long as we only have to love the people that we like. But God doesn't make a distinction. God says, no, you got that wrong. I love everyone. God loves the drug addict and the pusher. God loves the prostitute in the pimp. God loves the hobo and the billionaire. God loves the friend and the stranger. Well, I don't know. It's kind of tough to love some of those people. God loves 
the people that we throw in jail and then try to forget. God loves, and this is a stickler for me, God loves the Elizabeth Wetloffers of this world. And most of us don't. And we say, got good reason not to love her. But God says, but that's what it's all about. Loving who and what I love. And that's why it's so hard to show our love for God. Sometimes. Because we just can't bring ourselves to do it. Marcus Borg, in his book, Convictions, draws this to our attention. Loving what God loves includes becoming passionate about God's dream. And God's dream is a world of fairness in which everybody has enough of the material need basis of existence and in which there is no violence or fear. That is God's dream for the world. Jesus called that dream and that kind of world the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's the kind of world that we say we long for. A world where we feel safe and secure and free to be who we are without fear of judgment or condemnation or worse. That's what it means to show our love for God. Loving God is the key that opens to us the kingdom of God. Next Sunday, should you happen to show up for church, we're going to think about what it means to live in the kingdom of God. Amen. So let it be.